Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, this is Grizzard from the University of South Florida. This is Calculus uh, 1, uh, Fall 2020. Um, and tonight we are talking about derivatives and the shapes of graphs. Uh, so as usual, there is chat in Twitch. There is chat in Discord. You may ask questions. Um, and uh, our wonderful TA just got the polling system working. Um, I don't know if anyone is in chat because on the um, on Discord because I don't see anybody typing anything. Um, so, oh well. Um, so tonight what we're talking about are derivatives and the shapes of graphs. Uh, a couple of reminders here. Um, the test is not this Saturday, next Saturday. Next Saturday is the test. So weird test week schedule kind of goes into effect here. So, um, and I put the announcement on uh, canvas and I changed the the front page on canvas to reflect all the stuff about the test um, and you can see it there um, good idea just to go there um, and then remember that there's a test review Sunday night um, and then uh, there's a study plan quiz uh, that is due and there is um, uh, uh, office hours uh, tomorrow um, will not be on campus. I won't be on campus tomorrow. I think they give me a thing that I had to do a COVID test and I didn't have time to do it today. And I won't have time to do it tomorrow morning if I want to make all my appointments. So um, I'm going to have to go, you know, uh, get a COVID test before I can come back on campus um, and upload the thing. So that has to happen. So there'll be uh, office hours will be virtual tomorrow on Discord um, at the usual time. They just won't be in person. Um, and then on the, um, lovely, um, uh, 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 canvas page, um, canvas, yeah, yeah, um, you can see all of the test three information here, um, oops, uh, that should be gone, um, the, so on Sunday night, uh, of course this Sunday, uh, there will be a, at 7 p.m., there will be a review on Discord, a test review on Discord, uh, not on Discord, uh, Twitch and Discord, um, and then at 12.30 on Thursday, and then on Friday at, um, when the bootlegs do at 3. Um, uh, so, uh, last time I went through the whole bootleg, um, and it just took too long, so this time I'm going to go through highlights of the bootleg, um, and try to get the most things so that there's more time for people to ask questions. Um, so if you have any questions about that, please go ahead and post them and I will be happy to answer them. Um, other than that, that's what's going on. Okay. So last time we talked about optimization, um, and we're going to come back to optimization on Monday again for the last class before the test. Um, but I, we want to take a little interlude and kind of formalize this thing that we've been talking about the whole time on the uh, problem sets. So on the problem sets, we've been talking about, you know, the connection between derivatives and the shapes of their graphs. And tonight what we want to do is do the algebra, kind of show what's going on um, with the algebra, um, and then how to algebraically answer these questions. And then what we're going to do, so we're going to do those things. So where they've got local mins, where they've got local maxes, and how to kind of do the little algebra and take the derivatives and stuff that give you that information from a formula instead of from a, a, a picture. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to relook at some of these things that we had before, like inflection points. Um, not inflection points, like concavity. And we're going to ask questions about, well, what about things that are not differentiable? Uh, do you still have concavity conditions for them? And, and the answer is yes. Um, and we will look at uh, some of those things, uh, like the absolute value. Is it concave up everywhere? My answer is yes. And we'll look at a new definition of concavity that gets us a little bit more. And then we'll talk about this trick that you can use in optimization, using the fact that the function is concave up or concave down to tell whether or not you have a min or a max. Um, I mentioned it in the quiz reviews, which are still not up on YouTube, but hopefully will be soon. Um, since tomorrow I don't have to commute now, uh, maybe I can get it done tomorrow morning. Um, and all of those things. Are there any questions? And then next time on Monday, we'll come back to optimization and we'll do some more of those. And then I'll show you another way to get at optimization problems that are actually kind of slick. Because remember, optimization problems are kind of all different. 
Okay, so how do we feel about the plan? One to five. Okay. All right. So at least some people are answering, so I know that the chat thing, it looks like it's working. Um, okay, so what I want to do is I have this problem here, right? Uh, Ranger Dave here is wants to create an artificial lake with trout in it, right? So he starts by throwing 10 trout in it, and trout do what trout do. Um, and so tracking the, the trout population... He comes up with the fact that for the six first month, the number of fish in the pond uh, can be described by this function. Now, obviously, um, the function uh, has... Um, uh, now, first notice that this is a closed interval. And obviously, this function, you know, here I would wind up with, like, negative trap. All right, this negative T cube is going to take over as I go to infinity. Um, but, you know, I, I can't have negative trap. But for the first six months, this was a very good kind of fit for his curve. And what we want to know is, where is P increasing? Where is it decreasing? What are its, you know, uh, local, all the local extrema? And where are my concave up, concave down, and where are my inflection points? Okay. So basically, we want kind of the shape of the graph without actually looking at the graph. Let's talk about how we can do that. So the first problem is, and there's kind of three linked problems here. All right, so we'll call them A, B, and C. So where increasing, where decreasing, and where max mins uh, local. Okay. And the reason why I say that they are all related is because what I want to do is, uh, the reason why I want to say that they're all related, because they're related problems, um, is that these three problems all involve the first derivative. Okay. So these three problems are kind of first derivative. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to find the critical values of the function and then, and then use the first derivative to kind of see what's going on. Uh, find critical values of f, which I remind you are where f prime of x equals zero or f prime of x d and e. And I, I just want to, you know, see what's going on. I should say between, around, okay? So here's the idea. And remember, I had this idea, this big idea from before. Right? Wherever f, if f prime is positive, f is increasing. And if f prime is negative, f is decreasing. Okay, and if you do these little tables, the min and max stuff is really easy. Okay, so let me show you what has to happen here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative, and I'm going to set it equal to zero. So let's just make a little thing, critical numbers. 
Now, this is a closed interval, right? I've got less than or equal to. So this right here means that this is T on 0, 6 with closed endpoints. 1 to 5, how do we feel about that? That less than or equal to tells me I've got closed endpoints. So they go on. If they were open endpoints, I wouldn't do it. But these are closed endpoints. Closed endpoints go in, open interval endpoints don't. Okay? So the derivative doesn't exist at the closed endpoints, right? Because I don't have anything going on on the other side. And since the derivative, I mean, the derivative doesn't exist at the open endpoints either, but the open endpoints aren't in the domain. So I don't care. But these I care about because, you know, I, the derivative... Uh, doesn't exist. I could have like maxes and mins at these endpoints. So I, I toss them in. All right. Now, why am I increasing and where am I decreasing? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So uh, first thing, uh, P prime of T exists everywhere except the endpoints. Okay, so there's nothing in the middle that I need to worry about not being differential. This is a polynomial. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the derivative. So P prime of T equals, all right, so I got a little power rule here. I got negative 3t squared plus 12t to the first plus 0. How do we feel about that? 1 to 5. Took the derivative. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor it. So let's see. The t can come out. And so can a negative 3, or let's just take a, th yeah, no, let's leave the negative in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the t out, and then I'm going to rearrange this. This is going to become 12 minus 3t. And when I do that, I'm now going to factor out the 3, and I get 3t times... 4 minus t. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to set this equal to 0. And I get 3t, 4 minus t, which implies that t equals 0 or t equals 4. Okay. So now I've got a 0 and a 4. Um, and this actually doesn't exist because P prime of T doesn't exist there, but who cares? Uh, these were 4 is interior of 0 of 6, but that's fine. So these were F prime of X equals 0. Um, yeah. So this should be... Uh, this right here, note, exists. Okay, so we'll just make a little net. So that was true, but, you know, zero, it's not differentiable there, so I'm just going to take out the zero. Just as if it wasn't there. It doesn't really matter if I do that. Um, and I'm left with 0, 6, and 4. 1 to 5, how do we feel about that? Well, factor, you know, and I, I, I set it equal to 0. I get 0 and 4, and this is, well, it's not really differentiable there, but it is in the domain of the original function, so I'll just leave it. I mean, who cares? Um, it's a double thing anyway. Don't let me confuse you there. Okay, so now I've got some interesting things going on. Okay. 
Now, because I've got hard endpoints, I need to check them. All right, but I'm going to make myself a little chart. All right, I've got T here, and here's my little chart. I've got P of T, and I've got P prime of T. Okay. So now my points are zero, skip, four, skip, six. And then this thing is going to be filled with the interval zero, four, zero, six. Okay. One to five. How do we feel about that? So I'm making myself a little chart, and I'm interested in where am I increasing, where am I decreasing, and what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate P of 0, and that equals what? Um, so let me re rewrite my function. I've got P of T equals... Negative t cubed plus 6t squared plus 10. And I've got p prime of t equals 3t4 minus t. All right, so now I'm going to calculate p of this one, this one, and this one. So I've got p of 0 equals, now I plug this, this is p, into this. So I get 0 plus 0 plus 10, which is what we expected because we started with 10 fish. P of 4 equals negative 4 cubed plus 6 times 4 squared plus 10. Okay. So what am I going to do with that information? Well, do a little math here. Oh, uh, Let's see, this is going to be 16. So I'm going to do negative 16 times 4 plus, uh, well, something factor out of everything here. Well, the 4 factor, no, it too well. All right, so we're going to do negative 16 times 4. Uh, yeah, because that's on the outside. This is 6 times 16, and this is going to be plus 10. At some point, I'm just going to get a calculator out. Uh, so this becomes negative, this becomes 16 times uh, 6 minus 4 plus 10. Uh, 10 is easy to calculate off of. Uh, so 6 minus 4 is 2, so this becomes 16 times 2 plus 10, which equals 42. I uh, should have done that with the calculator. Somebody check to make sure I'm right, please. Okay. And now I'm going to do P of uh, 6, which equals, that What's worse, negative 6 cubed plus, oh, that's nice, 6 cubed plus 10. That equals 10. All right, negative 6 cubed plus 6 cubed plus 10. Okay. So 1 to 5, how do we feel about that? Okay. Now what I'm going to do, there's two things I can do. The first thing is I can look at this and go, duh. Okay? I can look at this and go, duh, and put increasing, decreasing right there. Now, I know that because...
I know that because I went down and then up. Okay? But let's let's do it the proper way. Okay? Now, if you did that on a test and you got this and you put little intervals right there, I'd be like, you go. But let's do it the proper way. Okay? So what I'm going to do for the proper way is I'm going to take test values in here. So a 1 is always a nice little number. So I pick a number between 0 and 4, 1 in this case. And this should be 4 and 6, not 0 and 6. And then I pick a number between 4 and 6, uh, 5. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw those numbers into the derivative. So p prime of 1 would equal uh, 3 times 1 times 4 minus 1, which equals uh, 3 times 3, which equals 9. And I don't actually care. I only care that it's greater than 0. And p prime of 5 equals 3 times 5 times 4 minus 5. Yeah. Which equals 15 times... Uh, I don't actually care. The only thing I care about is the fact that that's negative. But 4 minus 5 is negative 1, so that's negative 15. So that gives me those things. And the fact that I went up and then down gives me a max. Okay. So 1 to 5, how do we feel about that? I went up and then I went down and I got a max. Now, it seems a little silly, but what happens if the endpoints don't exist, right? So it, it actually is worth doing. You, you should do these things. Uh, this one's a little bit silly. This one's a little bit silly because I have endpoints. Um, if I didn't have these endpoints, and we'll do one later where I don't have the endpoints, you'll see why it's important to do do the first derivative testing. Okay, so now what I'll say is kind of my conclusion: p is uh, increasing on zero four. Decreasing on four six and has a local and global max at a four forty two. Uh, it uh, P has global and local men's at zero ten and six ten. Okay. How do we feel about that one to five? Okay, so here the okay, so the endpoints, the endpoints don't exist for the derivative. Okay? Because I don't have right, I've got a derivative from the left, but no derivative from the right. So p prime of t does not exist. Right? Remember when I have a derivative, it has to be from both the left and the right. And if I've got no left. You know, I don't have anything. All right. Okay, the next part of this is figuring out the concavity conditions. Okay. So these three parts are related as well. So D, E, and F. Where is P concave up? Where is P concave down? And where 
are the inflection points. Okay, and these three are the second derivative problems. So what I want are the critical values of the first derivative. Does that make sense? And it's the exact same problem, except now I take the, the uh, f prime as my function, and I find its critical values, its places where it's increasing, and places where it's decreasing. Okay? And let me show you what I mean. The problem is actually the exact same. Okay? So remember this little graph here. This was the big idea here. Uh, here is f, here is f prime, and here is f double prime. And wherever f double prime is positive, that means that f prime was increasing. That means f uh, is concave up. And wherever f double prime is negative, that means f, is de f prime is decreasing, f is concave down. So really, these three problems are just the same problem, but asking me about the derivative, right? These, this is the same thing as asking. Where p prime is increasing. This is asking where p double prime, p prime, sorry, p single prime, p prime is decreasing. And this is asking where p prime has local extrema. Okay? It's actually asking the exact same question, just about p prime instead of about p. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take p prime here. Um, I'm going to take this form because the derivative looks easier. So I've got p prime of t. I've got p of t equals negative t cubed plus 6. Uh, t squared plus 10. I've got p prime of t. I'm going to use the multiplied out version of this. So that should be more of a t, less of a, it's more of a gesture than a thing. Uh, p prime of t. I'm going to use this form of p prime of t. Negative 3t squared plus 12t. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the second derivative. Excellent. Okay, and now I'm going to find the, the I'm going to set the second derivative equal to zero because what I'm looking for are the critical values of the first derivative. Okay, so critical values of p prime. Okay, I don't have any endpoints because remember my derivative didn't exist at the endpoints. Oh. Mm. No endpoints. Okay, now, so what are my interesting values? I don't care about the endpoints anymore. I only care about where this is zero, right? P double prime defined on uh, D, 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 uh, what was it? Uh, zero, six. So 
So no DNE values. And then P double prime equals zero. There should be a T in there. When okay, so let's set this equal to zero. So if zero equals negative six t plus twelve, um, that stinks. Twelve minus six t still stinks. I should have factored out the six, but you can see that it's going to be two, right? Uh, that implies that t equals two. When t equals two, so I have one critical value. Uh, so someone's asking if the derivatives will ever exist at the endpoints if they are hard in, well no because if they're soft endpoints they weren't in the domain of the function to begin with if they're hard endpoints then the first derivative gets rid of them so that's a very good thought the first derivative kills your endpoints okay so what do I do here? I got my critical value. So now what I do is I make my little chart. Do, do, do. And I only have one critical value. Do, 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 do. And let's see. So I have here, I have t equals two. I have me and f, I have me and f prime, and I have me and f double prime. Here I know that this equals zero. Now, I'm going to do something that I'm going to look up here. So this one I'm going to fill in as t, uh, what was the other end point? Six, and this is zero, two. All right, so how do we feel about that, one to five? And don't let the endpoint thing mess you up, okay? It's just, just remember, if you have hard endpoints, you might have to do something different in the first derivative thing. Soft endpoints, they're the same thing. You just ignore them. Okay? Just like a little asterisk. Ignore soft endpoints. Hard endpoints you have to deal with in the first derivative only. When you do the first, when you do this one only. Okay. So now I'm going to look up here. Eh, let's see. I know that two. I know that p prime of t is positive. I think the function's going to go like this. Um, I think it's going to have con concave. I think it's going to be concave down here at four. I'll make myself a note. I, I this uh, should be concave down. Right. I'm just kind of looking at what I did before, saying, maybe. I don't have to do this, but it's just kind of a little check. Uh, should be think. Should be four. Should be concave up. Okay. Um, this side, I think, should be concave up. I'm not sure if it is, uh, you know, but if it's not... Oh, if it's not, I made a mistake somewhere, okay? Just kind of double-checking myself. Okay, so, right, it's a good indicator I made a mistake if I don't wind up with the right value there. All right, so here I've got F double prime. I've got two here. I need a sample point here and a sample point here. So I'm going to choose one. And I'm going to choose three. Okay. So my sample points, F double prime of one, or P double prime, not F. Go away. So P double prime of one equals uh, 12 minus six, uh, equals 6, which is greater than 0. So this side is plus. That makes you increasing. That makes you concave up. P double prime of... Uh, three. 
3 equals 12 minus 6 times 3 uh, equals negative 6, which is less than 0. Minus their concave down. Wait a minute. Something's wrong. Oh, I rewrote that, right? That should have been concave down, not concave up, right? Because it does this, not this. Oops. My check was wrong, not my thing. Anyway, so I go up, down like this. So I'm concave up there, concave down there. I'll go ahead and solve that for that inflection point. This is nice to say. So P of 2, I plug that in here, equals negative 2 cubed plus 6 times 2 squared plus 10. And that gives me negative 8 plus uh, 6 times 4, uh, 24, plus 10. And that's going to give me here, uh, uh, what will that be? That will be 26. Okay, how do we feel about that 1 to 5? I've made my little chart. So I just take the information on it. Okay, P is concave up on 0, 2, concave down. on 2, 6, and has an inflection point at, and this is a point, 2, 26. I just kind of write down what I did. All right. It's always embarrassing when your little check thing, you're like, oh, you could do this clever check, and then you were wrong about your check. Oh. Okay. So, no, you don't need to check for the test. Um, it's just... It's just kind of something I, I would like to do just because I'm just like, eh, I don't know. All right, so let's pull this out and graph it. All right, so let's pull out old Desmos and graph this function and see if it, it matched what we said. I said it was concave up from 0 to 2. And you can see the inflection point here. There it is. And then we said it had a max at t equals 4. There it is. And then we said it had a min here at t equals 6. Because remember, it's chopped off here, right? It doesn't actually go off to negative whatever, right? It's chopped off. It, it stops uh, there. There we go. It stops there at 6. Okay. There we go. So 1 to 5, how do we feel about this? There. Now the domain's right. And this sort of tells a story, doesn't it? I throw in 10 fish. They kind of breed, um, you know, and make more fish. And about here, they kind of start running out of room. And here and here they do. And then right here, they kind of max out. And then the minute I move past, the, when I get here, right, it's slowing down and slowing down. And then here, something happens where I have a population collapse. Like, you know... Uh, the genetic diversity goes to, you know, get, starts to get problems. And they kind of crash. 
and that cut is tells the story of the pond. Okay. So right here was when it was experiencing the fastest growth, right? And then it kind of slowed down and then crashed. Right? As Rod Stewart would say, every picture tells a story, don't it? Okay. All right. Well, that was kind of interesting. Let's look at this function. Mm. What did I want to say? Oh, this is section 4.3 in your books. So, um... The technical name for this, excuse me, Okay, that's the technical name. It's called the first derivative test in your book. Just in case you're looking stuff up later. Um, uh, you know it, I know it. Um, the American people know it, that you're going to go look up stuff. Um, because you don't like my videos. Um, you're going to go look up Khan Academy. Um, so just, you know, that's called the first derivative test, if that's what you're looking up. Um, and that's what the book calls it. Okay. So recall we had this idea about concavity. Okay? So what was our definition of concavity? What was our picture? All right? We kind of had this and this, and then we had like something that looked like this. And we said this was F was concave. Uh, so we had this idea that F was concave uh, down. Why won't this, like, come over here? It now responds to, okay, so it's not, it's responding to one touch. It's not responding to two touch anymore. And now it's pulling up this thing. And now it's not responding to my request for it to go away. There we go. All right, so I had this idea. It's not responding to two touch. Uh, let's see. Can I do this another way? Yes. So I had this idea. Wait, nope. Shapes. That F was concave down. I'm going to get rid of you, and I want you to move things around instead of right. It's not going to let me do it. Um, okay, well, fine. Um, I had this idea that F was concave down if the tangent lines ran above. Okay, so one to five, how do we feel about that? Uh, someone's asking, are we needing check for the test? Yes, you, the, the, the idea is, you don't need to define it, um, but the idea for that thing is something you need, okay? So I had this kind of idea, uh, so you have to be able to use it. You don't have to be able to write what it means. If that's what you're asking. Um, 
Okay. So that's a lovely idea. But look at the secant lines here. Let's see if this will work again. Nope. It just hates me. Okay. Let's look at the secant lines here. The tangent line ran above. That means the secant lines are running below. It just doesn't want to let me draw lines. Come here. Use the mouse to draw the line. There we go. Oops. There. Use the other computer and the mouse. Okay. That means the secant lines... run below. So I have this idea, remember from linearization, I had the following definition. F, let F uh, uh, be defined on D. F is concave down at x equals a if for all x near a uh, l of l f a of x equals uh sorry um do 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 LFA of X is greater than or equal to F of X. Okay, so one to five, how do we feel about that definition? That was the one where the, uh, the that means that the tangent lines run above. Okay, so one to five, how do we feel about that? The tangent lines are running above. But notice that this requires x to be differentiable at a. I can do better. Um, f is concave up at x equals a if for all x near a uh, l f. This is tangent lines run below. Uh, tangent lines run above, tangent lines run below. All right. I can do one better. Oops, I don't know what that is. Now what I want to say is all the secant lines run below. Okay. So what I'm going to say is F is concave down on the interval AB if for all UV subset of AB, notice this is a closed interval, that's a closed interval. Uh, S of 
a b of x is less than or equal to f of x. And then for all x and uv. So what I'm saying, and this is a much harder definition, but it's more general. And here's what I'm saying. Let's say I've got this function, and I've got here, this is f, and f has some points where it's not differentiable, right? So I've got f, and it's got like there, and then there's a kink at f. Uh, let's do something like this. Here is a, and here is b. Now, it's not going to let me do this, is it? Zoom in. Come on. Well, oh, come on. Be good. Okay, good. Now, here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that for every subset, so for every u, v, in between a, b, this secant line here, which is not a line because the ruler is not working. This secant line here runs below the function between those points. Yeah. Come on. The thing is really hot, and when it gets hot, it just stops behaving. Picking it up seems to have worked. Maybe it's getting cooler now or something. There we go. So the secant line here, S U V of X um, here is less than or equal to F of X between u and v. So this is concave down. Okay, how do we feel about that? One to five. Okay, this is a very complicated definition, right? This is a nice simple definition, but they both have the exact same idea. This one is the tangent lines run above, this one is the secant lines run below. But what it lets me do is say something about things that aren't differentiable. Okay. Okay, so this is secant lines below, secant lines above. Okay, so let's look at our old friend absolute value of x. Now, uh, let's just do them here. Our old friend absolute value of x. Let's see. Can I reset this? Not easily. Let's see. I want to get rid of u. All right. 
Now, oops, nope. Oops, nope. Now it wants speech recognition. There we go. Our old friend Absolute Value of X. There we go. Now, using our old definition, right, I couldn't say anything about the interval. It's just bringing that up randomly now. It, it just, just randomly. I'm not even touching the screen. It's bringing up that little thing. <sighs> okay. Uh, oh, so you want... Apparently not. I can't move it. You mean this one? The graph. Someone's asking me to focus on the graph. Okay. So, our old friend here, absolute value of x. Okay, now notice that this absolute value of x, or abs of x, is actually concave down from negative infinity to zero and zero to positive infinity. Why? Well, look at the definition, right? These definitions require less than or equal to's. So lines are both concave up and concave down. One to five, how do we feel about that? The definitions require less than or equal to, and not just less than, so lines are actually both. One to five. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by please move the... Okay. However, ABS is concave... ABS of X is concave up everywhere. Right, so now I have the secant line idea, and my secant lines run above the curve. Okay, secant lines are always above. So concave up everywhere. Okay. How 
How we feel about that? One to five. Hmm. Nice little thing. So that's a generalization on concavity. Um, so you you can extend the the idea to things that are more you know to things with kinks and those sorts of things. Um, all right, let's talk about the second derivative test. Okay. And it goes like this. Sometimes I can discover whether a uh, critical value is a max or min by looking at the concavity. Okay, sometimes I can look at this, all right? So let's give an example. Let's do, for example, uh, x squared, negative x, so 10 minus x squared, example. Uh, f of x equals 10 minus x squared, right? So f prime of x equals... Uh, negative 2x, f prime of x equals 0 implies that x equals 0. 1 to 5, how do we feel about that? So 0 is a critical number. For f. f double prime of x equals negative 2. So f double prime of x is, I'm uh, sorry, f double prime of 0 is less than 0, and f is concave down. So, I have a max. Okay. Okay, so, the second derivative test says the following. If f has, a, if f prime of x, it only works, of course. If f prime of a equals 0, and f double prime of a is greater than 0, f is a local min. If f prime of a equals 0, and f prime of a is, f double prime of a is less than zero, then f, uh, d, 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 d. then f of a is a local min, and f of a is a local max. And the pictures that go with this are like this, a up min, a down max. Okay, one to five, how do we feel about this? 
So that's that second derivative test thing that I was doing last time on the quiz, where I said, ah, oh, you can take the second derivative and look at what it means. But there's a caveat. Warning. If f double prime of a equals zero, the test tells you nothing. No, you don't have to write these definitions. You just apply them. Um, the pictures help. Basically, what you do is you remember the picture. Yeah. Um, oops, this should be part of the F. If F double prime of A equals zero, the test tells you nothing. I can make a prettier F than that, even with a hot thing. There we go. That's worse. That's better. Okay. So, example. Consider f of x equals x to the fourth, okay? f prime of x is going to equal uh, uh, 4x cubed. So f prime of x equals 0 implies that x equals 0. So f... So zero is one of my critical numbers, okay? Now, I do f double prime of x, which equals um, uh, 12 x squared. That implies, right? So f double prime of zero equals zero. What does that mean? Consider g of x equals x cubed. f prime of x equals 3x squared. So f prime of 0 equals 0, and 0 is a crit number. I should do uh, so, 0 is crit. x equals 0. x equals 0 is a critical number. Okay? f double prime of... I'm sorry, g. That should be g. It's getting late. I'm almost done, and I've been I'm ready to, you know, turn it in. This is the last little bit. g double prime of x equals uh, 6x. So g double prime of x equals 0. Now, what does this tell me? Okay. The answer is nothing. Okay, I promise you it's not my handwriting right now. It really is that the tablet's hot and it's got very poor response. Okay, but the point is that these double derivatives are telling me nothing. These are two very, very, very different functions. Okay, so let's graph them. There's x to the fourth. And look, I did have a minimum. Also notice I did not have an inflection point. The fact that the derivative was zero did not get, the second derivative was zero did not give me an inflection point. Let's look at x cubed. X cubed has neither a min nor a max. But for both of these, f double prime of x was z, f double prime of zero was zero. And that gave me no information. Okay, 
So the first derivative test gives you information pretty much no matter what, um, no matter what, okay? The second derivative test doesn't. It sometimes works and it's nice and slick and quick when it does, but if it doesn't work, you have to do the first derivative test. And personally, the first derivative test, unless I know that the second derivative test is gonna give it to me, right? If I'm looking at a quadratic, I know the second derivative test is gonna give me a constant, okay? But if, you know, this is going to either be positive or negative. But if I don't, it's only one more sub to do the first derivative test, and I don't have to take another derivative. So, you know, when it comes to, and I know it will work. So when it comes to doing that, you know, unless I know, unless I've got a quadratic and I know it's going to work, or something that I'm looking at, I'm like, oh, the second derivative will work fine. Um... I'm going to, you know, go to the little sides on the thing as we go. Now, let's do a first derivative test. Let's save some time. One to five. How do we feel about that? Okay. So let's just do what we, what we talked about today. So let's just go over just briefly what we talked about today. Um, hopefully the screen will come back. Uh, the tablet is very hot, so it's like... It doesn't want to do anything. It just wants to, like, it wants to go to bed. <sighs> it's like, you taught too much today. So let's just talk about really fast what we talked about today. We use the, the derivatives and the shapes of graphs, and we use this big idea here and this other big idea here. I should write that it's a big idea. Right? We use these two big ideas to talk about where the um, where I had increase, decrease, min, max, concave up, concave down. Okay, and then I talked about this kind of generalization on concavity, which you don't really you don't need. By the way, you don't need these formal definitions. Okay, yet uh, yet being you're not taking calc three. All right, you don't need these, or bridge to abstract. You don't need these formal definitions, um, but they exist. Um, and I do want you to have the intuitive notion, okay? So this idea that the secant lines run below, uh, the tangent lines run above, and the secant lines run below, and the secant lines run above, and the tangent lines run above below for concave up, that I do want you to have. You need this intuition, but you don't need the formal awful definition with double quantifiers here. I mean, this has got one quantifier, two quantifiers. I got a little subset thing. Ugh. Okay, but I do want you to have the intuition about this fact that we can generalize. And then we went over the second derivative test with this big warning that it doesn't always work. Okay, it doesn't always reveal the answer. Um, because if, um, if I, uh, you know... If I don't, if the second derivative doesn't give me any extra information, then I got to do a first derivative test anyway. So the, my tip was, unless you know it's going to work, you, you, you know, you've got one extra plug and you don't have to take another derivative. So just do the plug. Uh, any questions, comments, issues, suggestions, thoughts, hate mail, tips? Okay, I'm going to, ooh, I'm ending on time. That's new. Um, I'm going to, uh, hang out in discord for a little bit. Um, if you want to ask me questions, um, otherwise have a good evening.